Okay, so this video is on least squares regression. This content is extremely important and a little on the lengthy side. So settle in, take breaks when you need to, but do this bit by bit and until it sinks in because this is very important. Okay. A regression line is what you're used to calling the line of best fit. In statistics, we call it a regression line, and it is a line that describes how a response variable, Y, changes as an explanatory variable, X, changes. We can use this line to predict, that's a key word, to predict the value of Y for a given X value. A regression line is a model for the data. Okay, now we have this Y with this weird symbol over it, and it is called Y hat. Just like before we had X bar for mean of a sample, so this is Y hat, and that's how you say it, Y hat. Um, and when you write it, there you go. Now Y hat, is the predicted value. Y is an actual value. So make sure that you're really clear on the difference between a Y hat and a Y. Um, if I say um, I studied for four hours and I got a 95, um, this is going to be my explanatory variable, and this is my response variable. So this 95 is an actual Y. But if I say, okay, if I studied for four hours and I got a 95, I wonder what I would make if I only studied for three hours. So what I'm looking for there is a Y hat. I want you to predict my test score if I know how long I studied. So plain Y is an actual, it happened value. Y hat says, all right, let's estimate what you think it would be if X was this. Okay, so Y hat equals A plus BX. B is your slope, and that is the amount by which Y is predicted to change when X increases by one unit. And you're going to have lots of opportunities to state what the slope is and interpret its meaning. And it is the amount by which the Y is predicted to change when X increases by one unit. So for every hour more that I study, my grade is predicted to increase by whatever the slope is, 2.7 points. A is the y-intercept, which is the predicted value of y when x is zero. So for my um, grade kind of scenario I've got going on, it would be the predicted value of y when I don't study any. If I don't study any, my predicted grade on this test will be a whatever this number is. Okay, so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is based on this particular problem. How much is that truck worth? Everyone knows that cars and trucks lose value the more they are driven. Can we predict the price of a used uh, Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4 if we knew how many miles it has on it, the odometer? A random sample of 16 used Ford F-150 Super Crew 4x4s was selected from autotrader.com. The number of miles driven and the price were recorded for each of the trucks. So I have all the miles driven and I have the price in dollars. Okay, so I want you to pause the video and I want you to go to stat and edit, and I want you to type in all the miles for your L1 and all the prices into your L2. So pause the video and go do that, because you have to have that on your calculator.
Okay, so you go to Stat, Edit, L1, L2, and there is all your data. There's all the um, mileage and all the prices. Okay. To get the graph for this data, okay, you're going to quit out of this screen. You're going to go um, to Stat. Now, I don't want to edit. It's already in there. I want to calculate something. So I'm going to go to Calc, um, and we live on number 8. So linear regression, number 8, not number 4. So we want the A plus BX. Okay, so I'm going to hit number 8. Now, it's saying, okay, what data do you want to use? Well, I want to use the stuff that's in my L1 and my L2. Okay, leave your frequency list blank. Now, for this particular one, I'm going to store this somewhere, but normally when you're just getting the equation, you're not going to. But I want you to see how your calculator can also graph it. So I want to store the regression equation into my y equals. Okay, so I'm going to hit my vars button, which is right beside the clear. So I'm going to hit vars, and I'm going to go over to y vars. Vars stands for variable. Um, I want a function, so I'm going to hit enter, and then you can see there are my, all my y's, and that those are all correlate with your y equals button. So I'm going to hit enter. So now it says, okay, I'm going to store this equation in your y1, and now I'm going to calculate. Now again, you do not have to do the store if you don't want to graph it. I want to graph at least one. I want you guys to see where the graph comes from. So then I hit calculate. And it gives me all this information. We talked about how to get the R's on your calculator um, last time. So it shows me Y equals A plus BX. It tells me what my slope is. It tells me what my y-intercept is. It gives me R squared, which you don't know what that is yet. And it also gives me my R, which is my correlation coefficient. Okay, now to graph this, okay, if I want the line with all the little dots on it, what I'm going to do is I need to go, if you'll go above your Y equals button to where it says stat plot. So I'm going to go up here to stat plot. All your stat plots should be off, but I'm going to turn the first one on. So if you'll just hit enter. So this is everything about stat, stat plot one. So yours should look like this. And you want to go over to on and hit enter. Um, for type, you want the first one because that's the scatter plot, and then the X list and the Y list, we want to come from L1 and L2. So now all this data is the way that I want it, and you, if you want to, you can change how it shows up um, on your graph if you want to. You can do the little bitty dot or a bigger dot or a plus sign or the um, kind of squares. Okay, so now I want to graph it. Well, guys, if you just hit graph, remember your window goes 10, north, south, east, and west. The values in your L1 and L2 are massive. So I'm going to go to zoom, and I'm going to do number 9, zoom stat. Okay, so I'm just going to hit 9. And when you do that, you should see the line that we stored into your Y1 you should see all of the individual pieces of data from your L1 and L2 because you turned your stat plot on. And it should all fit in your window because you went zoom done. Okay, so just make sure you're very comfortable with doing all that. All right, so now you know where that picture comes from. So that came from our calculator. So now it says, all right, let's see. It says uh, find the regression equation. Okay. So my regression equation is y hat, not y, y hat equals, and it's a plus bx. Okay. So y hat equals, all right, I'm going to go to my calculator, and I'm going to find that a value. So... If I go to my calculator, quit out of that, go back to stat, over to calc, down to number 8. I don't need to store it again. I've already seen the picture. I just want to calculate it. Okay, so the A is 38,257.135. Okay, so here we go. 
Thir oh, hello. 38257.135. Um, and I think the B was a minus. Yeah, minus point one six three X. This is my y-intercept. This is my slope. It's still y equals mx plus b. It's just been flipped around. They got the mx in the back. Okay, now it says, so I've done part A. Okay, but here's the thing. I have just introduced an x and a y hat, and I haven't defined who they are. So when I do this, I have to come over here and I have to say, all right, x is, well, what does x represent? Okay, we'll go back and look at your chart. Your x is worthy number of miles driven. Okay, now I have a y hat, not a y. I have a y hat. And remember, y hat is not the price. It is the predicted price. Okay, now what you'll see sometimes is you'll see this. Price hat 38257.135 minus 0.163 number miles driven. That's totally fine. If you do that, then you don't have any variables to uh, define. If you use an X and a Y hat, which I usually do, then you just need to go off to the side and make sure you label what they are. Okay, part B, identify the slope and interpret its value in context. Okay, well, the slope is negative 0.163. All right, now, th this goes back to my math one teaching. When I interpret the slope, I put it over one, and I know that it's y's over x's, because I know slope is y minus y over x minus x. I know slope is the rise over the run. I know that slope is y over x. That's not new information. However, this is not y, this is y hat. So now when I make my slope statement, I can say for every one more mile driven, the predicted price of the truck decreases by 16 cents. For every one more mile that the truck is driven, the value of the truck decreases because it's negative by 16 cents. All right, part B. Identify the y-intercept and interpret its value in context. All right, uh, and I'm not going to use B for a y-intercept. Those are old habits. A, which is the y-intercept, or you could just say y-intercept. That's fine, too. Um, is 38257.135. Now, guys, on a graph, the y-intercept is a point. And on the y-axis, x is always 0. And then this number goes there. So this is x and this is y hat. So what this means is when the truck has been driven 0 miles, the predicted price of the truck it's $38,257.16. Now, notice, when I talk money, I don't go three decimal places. So, you know, sprinkle some common sense on there. If you're talking money, we're going to go two decimal places in our interpretation. Okay? So, these... There we go. So there we go. We have our y hat equals um, our prediction um, equation, our regression equation. And then I have the slope. Tells us that the price of a used Ford F-150 is predicted to go down by um, 16 cents for each additional mile that the truck has been driven. I think when I said it, I said for every additional mile that is driven, the value of the truck is going to decrease 16 cents. The y-intercept 
boom, there it is, 38,257 and some change is the predicted price of a Ford F-150 that has been driven zero miles. So make sure you understand that the slope is this, for every one of these, this happens, this changes, this increases or decreases. The y-intercept is a dot. It is not an active statement. It's a, if this is zero, then this is what it's predicted to cost or be. So three, like part A, B, and C are pretty standard part A, B, and C of any FRQ that deals with these kinds of problems. Okay, um, then your FYI, this, these are steps on um, graphing the line with all the dots on it. Um, remember you, that you have it um, on the video, you can just rewind. Um, uh, but I do want to point out this little FYI, the regression line, okay, so you have all your dots and then you have the line. The line will always go through the point X bar, Y bar. Now X bar is the mean of all the X's and Y bar is the mean of all the Y's. So for our truck problem, whatever the mean of the mileage is and the mean of the price is, our regression line will go through that exact point. That exact point is probably not one of the points in the table, but your regression line will always go through the point X bar, Y bar. Just a little, little nugget of information. Okay, so now let's let's use it. Now that we've got this equation, let's take it out for a spin. Let's see what it'll do for us. So I have a used Ford F-150. It's got 100,000 miles on it. Based on this prediction equation, I want you to tell me how much I should be able to get for it. Okay, so I'm taking my prediction equation. And again, we have words in here instead of X's and Y's. That's totally fine. So my Y hat, my price, is 38,257, and they've knocked the three decimal places off for that, um, which I don't recommend. I would leave those on there. And then we were going four decimal places here for some reason. Just stick with your three decimal places. And we're going to go 100,000 miles. Uh, type all that in. Y hat equals, again, maintain good form. I've got $21,967. Now they're going to the nearest penny because when you buy a car, you don't go to the lot and say, hey, I'll give you this car for $21,967.82. Like they just don't do that. When you talk about cars very rarely, well, I would almost venture to say never, you're going to go to the penny. Um, it is to the dollar. And usually it's nice round dollars. Like... $21,900 or $21,999 because that sounds so much better than $22,000. Um, but that's how much this car is predicted. Now let's talk about this for a second. If you have a truck that has 100,000 miles on it and I have a truck that has 100,000 miles on it and they're both Ford F-150s, are we guaranteed that our trucks are both worth the same amount? Heck no. My truck is beautiful. I wipe it down, I vacuum it out, I, I mean, I drive it hardly, uh, I, don't, I never drive it in the rain, I don't take it off-road. You take your truck off-road, you take it mud, you've taken it to fields and done bonfires, and you've had people dancing in the back of your truck and on top of the truck and on the hood of the truck, and you drug it across a field and it hit some barbed wire and scratched it all down the side, and then you wrecked it. So our cars are absolutely not worth the same. So there are other variables. But this is a this regression line relates these two particular variables together. So this is only based on mileage and cost. Okay? It doesn't have anything to do with body work or um, have you smoked in it? It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with that. So there are other factors that come into play with how much money our truck is going to be worth. But this is just predicting it based on mileage. 
Okay, so extrapolation sounds painful. Extrapolation is bad statistics. It is the use of a regression line for prediction far outside the interval of values of the explanatory variable x. Don't make predictions using values of x that are much larger or much smaller than those that actually appear in your data. So let's look at our, our um, graph. My lowest amount of mileage, and I could go back in and look at the table, and my highest amount of mileage is somewhere in there. So extrapolation means I can't use my equation to predict a truck with 5,000 miles on it. Well, I don't know how low these things went. How? What was my smallest mileage? I see an 8,000. I'm going back and looking at the table. So I think, oh no, there's a 4,000. 4,447. 4,447 miles. And the big one is, I don't know, I'm going to call it 150 just to be nice and round. Okay, so I can't use this equation to predict the value of a truck with 1,000 miles on it. That's extrapolation. 1,000 miles is outside my window of mileage driven for this data. I also can't use a truck that has 300,000 miles on it because that's way outside my range. Guys, look, if this line keeps going, don't you think we're going to be negative before we ever reach 300,000? And that doesn't make sense. A truck that has 300,000 miles on it isn't worth negative amounts of money. Heck, eventually, if you keep that truck in good enough shape, it's going to start to increase in value. That's called an antique. So extrapolation is when you use your equation to predict the value of a truck using mileage that is outside the window of mileage that you were given. And my data, my given data, only goes from around 4,500 miles to 150,000 miles. So I can't use mileage outside of that window to predict the cost of this truck. This data is only good for mileage within that window. So, and I'm going to ask you to do it. And they're going to ask you to do it. They're going to dangle the carrot. They're going to hope you get so wrapped up in, okay, where's my equation? I'm going to plug in a 300,000. Let's go figure this out. But it's extrapolation. You have to state, hey, that's extrapolation because that value is outside my window of data. I cannot use my um, regression equation to predict the value of that truck. It is extrapolation. Cannot be done. Okay, some data were collected on the weight of a male white lab rat for the first 25 weeks after its birth. A scatter plot of the weight in grams and time since birth in weeks shows a fairly strong positive linear relationship. The linear regression equation is, so here we go, we got y hat, y is your weight, um, 100 plus 40 times the time models the data. Okay, so I want you to pause the video and I want you to answer these questions. I want to know what is the slope and what does it mean? I want the y-intercept and what does it mean? I want you to predict the rat's weight after 16 weeks and I want you to answer number four. Pause the video, answer all of these completely like it was on a quiz or something and then hit play and check your answers. Okay, so the slope is 40. Now I'm going to put it over 1 so that I can label. Okay, here's what you should have written. For each additional week, we predict that the rat will gain 40 grams of weight. For every additional week, I predict that the, the rat will gain 40 grams. What is the y-intercept and explain what it means? Well, the y-intercept 
Remember, that's A. Okay, the y-intercept is a point, so 0, 100. Write that out if you need to. That's my y-intercept. He's x, he's y-hat. Okay, explain what it means. So there's my y-intercept. Explain what it means. It means the predicted weight of a rat at birth is 100 grams. The predicted weight of a rat at birth or zero weeks old is 100 grams. Predict the rat's weight after 16 weeks. Okay, now if this is an FRQ, you give me formula, then you plug in, and then you tell me the predicted weight is 740 grams. Why hats on everybody? Because this is not what it's going to be. This is what it is predicted to be. Should you use this line to predict the rat's weight at age two years? Use the equation to make the prediction and think about the reasonableness of the result. Um, and just FYI, there are 454 grams and a pound. Okay, so should I use uh, two years? Well, this data goes for the first 25 weeks. So 25 weeks is, what, six months? So no, absolutely not. This is extrapolation. So absolutely not. Predicting the rat's weight at age two years is using data outside the range of the data that I have collected. Therefore, it is extrapolation, cannot be done. Okay, now it says do it anyway, all right? Uh, two years, 62 weeks and a year, so that's 104 weeks. I should have written my equation, hold on. Um, X, sorry. Uh, for I got 4,260 grams. Now, I don't speak grams, so I don't know what that means. But I do know that there are 454 grams in a pound. So I'm going to divide that by 454, and I get 9.4 pounds. Now, I don't know about you, but guys, when I go bowling, I usually grab an 8-pound bowling ball. Sometimes I'll get a little frisky and grab a nine-pound nine bowling ball. Um, my husband usually grabs an 11-pounder. Um, think about this. If you've been bowling before and you pick up that bowling ball, we'll say it's roughly 10 pounds. So this rat is 9.4 pounds. That's a hefty rat. Two-year-old rat that weighs as much as a bowling ball. So you guys can see extrapolation does not work here. This is not uh, what happens because, guys, after a certain number of weeks, the rats stop growing or they stop growing at the same rate. Their growth slows down. So this equation, regression equation, is only valid for the first 25 weeks of their life. After that, the data changes. The slope isn't as steep because they're growing they're not growing as fast so make sure that you understand extrapolation okay now we're going to talk about residuals okay the residual is the difference between an observed value and the predicted value so the residual, and there's no letter for residual. You can't use R because R is the correlation coefficient. Um, so we, we just write out the word residual. It is the observed Y minus the predicted Y. Now, this is in no way, shape, or form on your formula sheet. You have to remember this one. So the residual is the observed Y, what actually happened, minus the predicted y, what should have happened. 
So the residual is kind of the leftover. Um, if you guys, you've heard the word residue. Residue is like a film that gets left over. So the residual is, is kind of like that. It's kind of the leftover. It's, well, here's what actually happened. I was, I actually made a 95. I was predicted to make a 93. So my residual is a positive 2. I did better than I was predicted. Okay, let's go the other way. I actually made a 90. That was predicted to make a 95. My residual is now a negative 5. I am 5 points below what I was pred predicted to make. My residual is negative. I am below the line. So find and interpret the residual for the Ford F-150 that had 70,000 and some change miles driven, had a price of 21,994. Now guys, this was in the table. This is what actually happened. That's why, that is not why hat. This is an actual truck with actual mileage and that's what it's actually posted for. That is a Y value. I need to find its Y hat. Well, we have a formula that finds the Y hat. Let's see, the formula from the Ford F-150. Y hat equals 38,257 minus 0.629x. So predicted value 38,257 minus 0.1629 and it was driven X's mileage, 70,583 miles. All right, pause it, grab your calculator, type that puppy in. I got Y hat to be 26,759. Now, that's Y hat. This is its predicted price. This is what it's actually being sold for. So talk to me about this truck. It's predicted to be 26 and some change. It's listed for just under 22. What's going on with this truck? Well, it's probably got some body damage. Maybe the interior is not in great shape. Maybe the engine's not running like it should. Maybe it's got a bad timing belt. I don't know but it's predicted to sell more from than what we're actually selling for it. Nope, than what we're actually selling it for. So to find the residual, again, formula first. Okay. What it actually is selling for is 21,994. What it's predicted to sell for is 26,759. So its residual is a negative $4,765. So that's it. That's it. Uh, like we've missed the mark. We've missed it by almost $5,000. And it's negative. So number one, address the fact that it's almost $5,000. But number two, also address that it's negative. It being negative meant the Y hat was bigger. So it's predicted to sell for much more, almost $5,000 more than what it actually sold for. Meaning, there has to be something else going on with this truck. Because just based on mileage, it should sell for $26,759. However, we're selling it for just under $22. So something's off. Okay, the line shown makes the residuals for the 16 trucks as small as possible. Residuals can be positive or negative. We just had one that was negative. If, okay, go back to the truck data. If my residual was positive, then I'm trying to sell it for more than what the mileage says it's worth, which means that truck better be nice. Great body, great interior, great engine. I mean, it must be really nice to sell for more than what it's predicted to sell just based on the mileage alone. So that's if I had a positive residual. Um, residuals can be positive or negative, so they could cancel out. 
Therefore, we square the residual numbers so they're all positive. That's how you get this thing called the least squares regression line. The least squares regression line is the line that makes the sum of the squared residuals as small as possible. Okay, so here's our truck data. Um, and I'm, look, I'm looking over here. Here's my truck data. This dot is an actual piece of data. These are all my y hats. That is from my equation. Those are all my y hats. These little dots are all actual trucks. These are all y's. Okay? The residual is the vertical distance between the two. Do y'all see that? Some of these are going to be positive and some of these are going to be negative because remember it's y minus y hat. So if your y's are above, then your residual is going to be positive. If your y's are below, if it's smaller than the predicted, then these values are going to be negative. So that's why it says some are positive and some are negative. So I square them. I square all these residual numbers to make them all positive, and then I add all of these residuals up, and I want that value to be as small as possible. That's how I know where I want my line to go. That's how I knew I wanted it to go there and not go like that, because this line right here, this wonky line, has a bigger residual square, a bigger residual value total. Um, so, let's see, hold on. The sum, there it is, I was looking for it, is the line that makes the sum of all the squared residuals as small as possible. So, guys, what your calculator is doing is it's, it's doing all these y minus y hats for all of these points, and it's getting these values, and then it's squaring them to make them all positive, and then it's adding them all together. So it's going to be a pretty hefty number, but I want the line that's going to give me the smallest residual total possible. And that's how I know that that's where the line should go, that it should go there instead of maybe like that or like that. So that's how your calculator calculates. It does not pick two dots and find the slope and the y-intercept. It finds the angle of the line just so that the sum of the squared residuals is as small as possible. Okay, so let's talk about residual plots. In general, trucks with more miles driven have lower prices. Okay, in general, trucks with more miles driven have lower prices. Okay, I'll buy that. A truck that had 68,474 miles driven had a price of almost 34,000. This truck is marked on the scatter plot with an X. That's this guy right here. So there's him. That many miles, that price. Because this point is above the line, we know that the actual price is higher than the predicted price. Okay, again, that makes sense. I know his residual should be positive. And also that means that this truck should be in relatively good shape because it's selling for more than what it's predicted to do. Find the residual for this truck, okay? Uh, well, I already know the actual. That's my Y. That's what it's actually selling for. I want to find the predicted. And his mileage was 68,474. Okay. Type all that in, and I get $36,895. So, ladies and gentlemen, that based on his mileage, is what he should be selling for. So, hold on. Three, eight, two, five. Oh, no. Mm -mm. No, that's not right. I mean, the formula is right, but I got to retype this in. I was on the next one. All right, 38257 minus 0.1629 times 
68474. There it is. I got Y hat to be 27102.59 um, since it's money. I'm only going to go to decimal places. Okay. So now I can see that it is predicted to sell for twenty-seven thousand. I sold it for, and trying to sell it for almost thirty-four thousand dollars. That's a huge residual. So then, if I subtract the two, so it's y minus y hat. It's actual. So thirty-three nine sixty-one minus the predicted twenty-seven one zero two. Twenty-seven. 102. I'm going to take the 59 cents off since we're talking cars and thousands of dollars. 859. That's an almost $7,000 residual. So I found the residual for this truck. It's almost $7,000. That truck better be nice because it is predicted to sell for much more than or it is on sale for much more than what it is predicted to sell for. All right, the 16 points used in calculating the equation of the least squares regression line produce 16 different residuals. We just found the residual, there he is, for, um, what was the amount of 68, 474. So now what they've done is they have found the totals, the total residuals, or the each residual for every single point. In blue, I did I found one. So they have found all of them. Now they haven't squared any of them yet. But if I were to add these together and divide by the total number, the mean of the least squares residual should be zero. I want the overs and the unders to cancel each other out. I want it to average. I want the residual to average to be a zero. Now let's look at a residual plot. Okay. A residual plot focuses on the vertical deviations of the points from the line. Because the mean of the residuals is always zero. Look at the second graph. The horizontal line at zero helps orient us. Okay, so y'all look, they've turned the graph completely horizontal. I have a, a line going horizontally out from zero. So if the residual is zero, that point should be dead on it. So guys, you can see that this truck right here, this one right here, that one's not bad. These trucks are all relatively close to their residual or to a residual of zero, which means what was predicted and what they're for sale for is pretty close. Now you can see there are some that are negative and there are some that are positive and there are some that are really far away. They have higher residuals or bigger residuals. Those have to have some sort of compounding factors like this guy who has, what, 45,000 miles on it, has a negative, I don't know, $8,000 residual, a negative $8,000 residual. Now, remember, residual is Y minus Y hat. So for him to be negative, the predicted has got to be bigger, right, for, for that value to be negative. For this to give me a negative number, he has got to be bigger, which means he's got to be smaller. So that means he sold way under what he's predicted to sell for. So something's wrong with the truck. It doesn't drive right. It's been wrecked. Something. Something's off. Or maybe the guy just wants to dump it. Maybe he's just in a super hurry. Now, this guy right here has a huge residual. Positive. Positive residual. That means now... My Y is bigger and my Y hat is smaller, which means this guy is selling for almost nine grand over what it's predicted to sell for just based on mileage. This guy thinks a lot of his truck. I mean, it must be gorgeous. 
it must be maybe it's on a lift and it's all jacked up and it's got the rims and the fog lights. I don't know. I don't know what trucks have, but it's got all kinds of bells and whistles that up the price because just based on mileage, this guy is supposed to be here. This is how much the owner thinks about his truck to jack the price up nine grand. So can you guys see that this this is a residual plot? It always has a horizontal line at zero, and all it's doing is emphasizing these vertical distances. These are all the ones that are above, and then these are all the ones that are below. So they match up with these. It's just it's just the vertical distances. That's all a residual plot does. Find the residual for the truck that had 8,355.59 miles driven and a price of 31,891. All right, hold on. Let me clean up my graph. Okay. Find the residual. Okay, for the truck that had 8,359. So that's got to be... This guy and driven a price of 31. Yeah, yeah, that's this, that's that blue dot right there. Find the residual. Okay, so I know that this is what he was for sale for, so that's why. And I now want to find um, his predicted value. So y hat equals. 38257 minus 0.1629x. There's my formula. Now we use it. 38257 minus 0.1629. I'm plugging in 8359. I get a y hat of, when I type that in, $36,895. The residual is y minus y hat. Y is what actually happened. Y hat is what should have happened. And I get a residual of a negative $5,004. Interpret, interpret the value of this truck's residual in context. Okay, here's what I'm going to write. The actual price of this truck is $5,004 less than what it's predicted to sell for just based on mileage. The actual price of this truck is $5,000 less, $5,004, less than what it is predicted to sell for if we were to just base it on mileage, which leads me to think something's wrong with the truck or it has some issues. Maybe it's got a big dent. Maybe the paint's chipping. So interpret the value of the truck's residual in context. So tell me what the residual is. Tell me if it's over or under, and what does that mean? Is the, the actual value above or below the predicted price? And then tell me what that means. Like put your Captain Obvious hats on and tell me that that means something's wrong with the truck. Okay. For what truck did the regression line over predict the price by the most justify your answer over predict for what truck did the regression line I'm gonna come over here and look at my residual plot over predict the most so if I'm over predicting that my actual price is going to be below. So I want the one that's the lowest. That's this guy. Then I look to my table to find that actual value so I don't eyeball it. Um, and the mileage is the four, 44,447 miles. Um, it has a price of 22,896 with a residual of negative $8,120. So 
So he is under the predicted price. They over predicted him. He is actually eight grand below what he's predicted to be, which means this truck has some serious issues. He's got some paint chip. Maybe his front bumper is bungee cord, tied on. Who knows? All right. Examining residual pot plots. In effect, it turns out that the, regress the regression line is horizontal. Nope. In effect, it turns the regression line horizontal. It magnifies the deviations from the points from the line, making it easier to see unusual observations and patterns. We often use residual plots to determine if the model we are using is appropriate. All right, this is really good. This is really important. When an obvious curved pattern exists in a residual plot, the linear model that we are using is not appropriate. When we use a line to model a linear association, there will be no leftover patterns in the residual plot, only a random scatter. So, if I look at A, and I look at those dots, and I look at that line, that's not bad. I've got about the same number of points above it as I do below it. But guys, I can look at that graph, and I can tell that a linear model is not good for that data. I mean, look, it's a parabola. I shouldn't be using a linear line to, uh, to model parabola data. But... He's going to have a pretty solid R because those, those dots are pretty tight on that line. However, if you will take him and plot his residuals, you will definitely see a pattern. If you see a pattern in the residual plot, you should not use a linear model to, to predict it. So I see a definite curved parabola in my residual plot. So a linear model is not appropriate. The only way I can tell that is by looking at my residual plots. This graph shows the residual plot for the Ford F-150 data. Because there's only random scatter in the residual plot, we know that the linear model that we have created is appropriate. Okay, so you need to know how to uh, graph a residual because you're going to have to check the residual plot to see if a linear model is appropriate. So grab your calculators. You've already got your truck data in there. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to stat and I'm going to go to edit. And I think on here it says stat and then calc. You need to go to edit because we need to go get the residuals. So I'm going to go stat, I'm going to go to calc, and then I'm going to go, or edit, sorry, I'm going to go up on my L3s. Now, it's going to work for this data because I have already found my equation. But if you try to use, if you try to go do what we're getting ready to do and you haven't done stat calc number eight, and told your calculator what this equation is, the y equals a plus bx, then what we're about to do is not going to pop up. Okay, So I'm going to go to L3, and then I'm going to go to list. Now list is the second function of your stat button. So I'm going to go there. Now look at number seven. It says residual. Now, if you have not, if you skipped the step, if you're mooching off of my work and you never did stat calc and went down to number eight, and hit enter, and if your calculator does not know what the y hat equals equation is for this data, you will not have a number seven. It'll do one through six and it'll stop. And residual won't even be an option for you. So you have to do, let me show you what I'm talking about. You have to do stat calc number eight enter yes 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 
boom, now my calculator knows what my equation is. So now when I go to list, nope, I got to go to stats first. When I go to stat and edit and I get up on my L3 and then I go to list, boom, there's residual. But if you don't see a number seven there, you need to be thinking, oh, that's right. I never did my stat count down to number eight. Okay, so I'm going to hit residual. So what I'm telling my calculator is, okay, listen, dude, I need you to go find all these residuals for me, every one of them. So I'm going to hit enter. Boom, found them. Some positive, some negative, because, you know, some are above the line and some are below the line. Okay, so now that it has found my residuals, now I want them to graph those residuals. So, now this is cool. You're going to go to stat plot, which is your y equals, but the second function. So, stat plot, I'm going to hit enter. Now, this dude is already on from before, so I've got him on, but where was your residual? Your residual was in your L3. So I want to keep my L1. I want to keep my mileage, but instead of L2, I want my L3s. Now your L1, L2, L3 live above the buttons 1, 2, and 3. So you should see a blue L3 above my number 3. So to get blue, I'm going to go second L3. Okay, um, I'm fine with the little squares. You know what? I'm going to go back to just dots. I'm going to go big dots. I'm going to do that one. Uh, blue, sure, that sounds great. Uh, so now I want to graph it. Well, remember, to, to have your calculator adjust the window so you can see the graph, I'm going to go zoom 9, zoom stat. It's very um, kind of Captain Obvious for this class. So zoom stat, boom, there's my residual plot. I've got my horizontal, that's at zero, that's the x-axis. I got a scattering of points above it, a scattering of points below it. I see no obvious pattern in my residual plot. Therefore, I know that a linear model is appropriate. That y equals a plus bx, we're good to go. Because there is no pattern in my residual plot. So, there he is. Um, oh, this is a different one. So here's a residual plot for the least squares regression of pack weight on body weight for eight hikers. So I've got body weight. I've got their backpack weight. These are the residuals. One of the hikers had a residual of nearly four pounds. Interpret this value. Pause the video. Answer that one. Okay, he had a, a residual of nearly four pounds. Uh, that means that the backpack for this hiker was almost four pounds heavier than was predicted on any hiker of this weight. One more time. The backpack for this hiker was almost four pounds heavier. Remember, this is a positive residual. So, and residual is Y minus Y hat. So that means the Y was bigger. So the actual was bigger than what it was predicted. So this dude or chick is, is carrying a pack that's four pounds heavier than they were predicted to, to carry based on their weight. Based on the residual pot, plot, is a linear model appropriate for this data? The answer here is yes, because there is no pattern in the residual plot. Yes, a linear model is appropriate for this data because there is no pattern in the residual plot. Okay, how well does the line fit the data? So we can talk about the standard deviation of the residuals. Um, it's a formula. You don't need to memorize it. It is not on your formula sheet, I don't think. Um, I, and I, I honestly, I don't know. He's not like crazy important, but your standard deviation is that typical distance. So we interpret this value as the typical distance of data points from the mean. Okay, so now this is something you're going to have to interpret. What is the standard deviation for the residuals for the Ford F-150 data? Um, so the uh, standard deviation turns out to be $5,740. 
when we use the least squares regression line to predict the price of a Ford F-150 based on mileage, not body shape, not engine wear, not bungee cords holding it together, just based on mileage, because that's all our prediction equation handles is mileage and price. So one more time, when we use the least squares regression line to predict the price of a Ford F-150 based on mileage, our predictions will typically be off by $5,740. And that $5,740, you can do a one variable stats on your L3s because that's where your residuals are. So you can go do a one variable stat, just make sure you do it on your L3 and it'll give you that $5,740 in your standard deviation. My, what I want you to focus on is that the black type right there, the interpretation. When I use my least squares regression line to predict the price based on mileage, I am predicting the price, but I'm only predicting it based on mileage. My predictions will typically be off by about $5,700. Okay. Hang in there, guys. We're almost done. Hang in there. Okay, so when you have done the stats calc and down to number 8, and it gives you the A and the B and the R squared and the R, we've talked about everything but the R squared. So here we go. The R squared is called the coefficient of determination. It literally is R squared. It is your correlation coefficient value squared. Now remember, your correlation coefficient lived between a 1 and a negative 1. So I'm taking that value and I'm squaring it. So my coefficient of determination will always be positive. Um, the coefficient of determination is given on your calculator directly above the correlation coefficient. It gives you A and then gives you B and then R squared and then R. What is R squared? Sorry, I don't know why he's down there. What is R squared for the Ford F-150 data? And here's the kicker. How do we interpret this number? Okay, so let me... All right, so... So stat calc number eight. L1, L2, yep, 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 yep. Calculate. Boom, there's my R squared. Now your R squared is a percent. So this is 66.425%. So here's what this means. And this is a rubber stamp sentence. You need to memorize this. I want it exactly like this. Exactly rubber stamp this sentence. 60, about 66 percent of the variation in the price is accounted for or explained by the linear model that relates the number of miles driven to the price. Okay, I'm going to say that again and then we're going to chew on it for a second. 66.4 percent of the variation of the of the flux fluctuation of the variability in the price, the wiggle room in the price, is accounted for or explained by the model that relates miles driven to the price. So 66% of why the price varies is explained by the mileage driven, which means about 34% is explained by other things like engine wear and body damage and how's the interior and doesn't have good tires on it. What's the Carfax? Has it been wrecked before? So the R, the, the coefficient of determination, determines the amount of um, the percent of accountability based on mileage, which is what our sweet little model does. Our sweet little model says, you tell me the mileage, I will predict your price. But that's it. I'm just basing it on mileage. Well, okay. And the prices are going to fluctuate. 66% of that fluctuation is accounted for or explained by the model, our model, that relates miles driven to the price. 
which means 34% is explained by or accounted, no, explained for or accounted by other variables like has it been in a wreck? Does it have body damage? Does the engine run? Is the interior nice? Somebody smoke in it? Did you hit a deer and your whole front grill is missing? So the coefficient of determination is the percent of variation in your Y's based on your X's. In section 3.1, we looked at the relationship between the average number of points per scored per game and the number of wins for 12 college football teams in the SEC. Using the given information, answer the questions below. Okay, so there's my Y hat, my prediction equation, my least squares regression line. I'm given an R squared and I'm given an S. Now remember, S is the standard deviation of your residuals. I'm given a lovely um, scatter plot with a prediction line through it, and I'm given a residual plot. All kinds of questions I can ask here. Okay, calculate and interpret the residual for South Carolina, which scored 30.1 points per game and had 11 wins. Okay, so here I go. Calculate and interpret the residual. For South Carolina, okay, so y hat equals negative 3.75 plus 0.437x formula. Now I'm going to predict what they, sh how many games they should have won based on their 30.1 points. So negative 3.75 plus 0.437 times 30.1. Type that into my calculator and I get 9.4 predicted wins. That means based on their average of 30.1 points per game, they should have won about 9.4 games. However, they won 11 games. So now I'm going to find their residual. So their residual is y minus y hat. Well, Y is the actual. They actually won 11. I was predicting them to win 9.4, which means they won 1.6. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, 1.6. I got distracted. 1.6 more games than expected based on the number of points scored per game. Just based on points. They won 1.6 games more than they were expected to. So that is calculating and interpreting. B, is a linear model appropriate for this data? Yep, there is no obvious pattern in the residual plot. Yes, because there is no obvious pattern in the residual plot. Look at it, it looks like a random crap ton of points to me. No pattern whatsoever. Okay, here are the two big ones. These, these are the two big ones, and they get people every single time on testing quizzes. Interpret the value of S. Okay, now I told you what it was. I told you it was 1.24. Okay, so here I go. When using the least squares regression line to predict the number of wins based on the points scored, we will typically be off by about 1.24 wins. One more time, when I use my equation that relates this and this together, I will tip my predictions will typically be off by this, whatever you're measuring. So there's, there's sort of your, your structure. So here we go. When using the least squares regression line to predict, what are we predicting? We're predicting the number of wins and what are we basing that off of? The number of points scored per game. When we do that, remember this is a standard deviation, we will typically be off by about 1.24 wins. You need to be able to fabricate that beautiful sentence out of thin air. Okay, part D, interpret the value of R squared. 
R squared is your coefficient of determination. And it tells you how much of the variability is accounted for or explained by your model. Okay, so here we go. My R squared was 0.88. You're going to write it as a percent. So about 88% of the variation in wins, the variation in the output, my predictions, my wins, is accounted for or explained by the linear model, our linear model, that relates wins to points per game, which means 12% of that variability is explained by other factors. Um, I don't know, maybe game day was at their school and they were super hyped and they won a game they shouldn't have, or maybe their quarterback got injured and they had to play without him, so they lost a game that they shouldn't have, or maybe it was raining and weather is the biggest equalizer in sports ever uh, for games that are played outside, and maybe they lost a game they um, should have won, or maybe the underdog beat um, beat the, the guy who was supposed to kill them, um, and the underdog won um, because it was raining and um, the underdog snuck up and won. I don't know. But 12% is explained by all these other factors. 88%, which is pretty good, is, is accounted for the model that relates points scored to number of wins. Okay. Um, interpreting computer regression output, um, and I'm sure this is super fuzzy on your copy, um, so I just want to make sure that if I give you, these are called mini tabs, um, and, and the one that's highlighted is the one that you're going to see the most. I want you to make sure, because nothing is labeled slope and y-intercept, like I want you to be able to point that, to, to see it, super easy. So um, you're not going to have this word or this word on here. You're going to see coefficient, and you're going to see constant, and then this, so this is the truck data. So miles driven. So where it says the constant, that's your y-intercept, which makes sense because this is what you're used to, y equals mx plus b, and that's your y-intercept, and it is a constant. We are now y hat equals um, a plus bx. There's your constant. There's your y-intercept. So the constant is the y-intercept. The one beside the miles driven or the number of games won, that is going to be your slope. That's him. But again, remember, it's not going to say this or this. All you're going to see is um, what's in gray. So the constant is the y-intercept, and the one beside whatever your um, x values are, that's your slope. There's your standard deviation of your residuals, your S, and there's your R squared right there. Now, if I give you R squared and I ask for the R, if R squared is 0.664, then to get R, you would just square root it. And I don't know what that is. Um, let's make it up. Let's say it's, I don't know, 0.59. So, but remember, your R could be positive or negative. Your R squared will always be positive because to get it, you're squaring your R. So how do you tell if your R is positive or negative? Well, it's completely based on your slope. If your slope is positive, then your R is going to be positive. And if your slope is negative, then your R is going to be negative because there's a negative relationship. Um, okay, last one. Hang in there. A random sample of 15 high school students was selected from the U.S. Census at School database. The foot length in centimeters and height in centimeters of each student in the sample were recorded. Okay. So... Um, nothing's been labeled here. I've highlighted the important things. Okay, so remember what I said. Constant, that's my y-intercept. Foot length, that's going to be my slope. All under the words coefficient. 
Okay, there's my S, there's my standard deviation of my residuals, and there is my R squared, which means I could get my R, I can just square root that, 0.486, I would just square root that and get my R, and my slope is positive, so I know my R is going to be positive, okay? They gave me a scatter plot and a residual plot, that's, that's very nice of them. Okay, what is the equation of the least squares regression line that describes the relationship between foot length and height? Define any variables that you may use. Okay, well here's my equation and I got it from that little mini tab up there. So my 2.7469, what's green? That's my slope and my 103, that's my y-intercept. So you guys can see that's where those values came from. But remember, I used y hat and x, so I have to come over here and define my variables. And when you define y hat, you have to make sure you use the word predicted. And I'm also using units of measurement. So just make sure that every time you use variables, you kick them out to the side and define them. And when you use that Y, make sure you put a hat on it and make sure you use the word predicted. It says interpret the slope of the regression line in context. Okay, so my slope is 2.7469. Put that over 1. Think about who's X and who's Y. So here we go. For every additional centimeter in foot length, we predict an increase because it's positive of 2.7469 centimeters in height for every one additional centimeter in foot length we predict an increase because it's positive in height those are things i'm going to be looking for find the correlation okay so if r squared equals 0.486 then the square root of that is either positive or negative, but because my slope is positive, I know that my R is positive. So R is a 0.697. Is an appropriate model, is a line an appropriate model to be used for this data and explain how you know? Yes, because the residual plot has no obvious patterns. All right. Um, I spy in your future a quiz where I give you um, either a set of data and you have to go find the Y hat or I give you a mini tab and I give you the data in there and you have to write your prediction equation. You have to define your variables. Um, you need to tell me what the slope is and interpret its value. Same thing for the Y intercept. Um, you're going to use it to predict something um, maybe with extrapolation, maybe not. So if it's good, then you're going to predict it. If it's extrapolation, then you're going to say that I can't. Um, you're going to find me your R and tell me about the, um, the direction and the strength and the um, shape. And you're going to find R squared, which is your coefficient of determination. You're going to interpret that. I'm going to give you the S, so you're going to talk to me about the standard deviation of the residuals. You're going to use your um, equation to find me residuals of something, so you know that you need to know that the residual is Y minus Y hat. Um, what else could I ask you? I'm going to ask you if a linear model is appropriate. Um, I mean, gracious, I could ask you tons and tons and tons of information just based off of one problem. So I spy in your future after we've done the homework um, a quiz. So in the next couple of days, like I said, not our next class because you have to practice this first. I, I get that. So we'll practice it. Um, but you guys can see how I can give you like Ford F-150 data and ask you a thousand different questions um, all, all on one set of data. So see how this would be really good for me for a quiz, but guys also see how it would be really easy um, on an, as an FRQ on your AP exam. Um, this is one problem. Remember, there are only six FRQs on your AP exam. And this could be one of them. And they're hitting lots of topics with one question. 
So um, go back and watch the video. Um, if you need to rewatch some parts, make sure you're very comfortable with your calculator and let me know if you have any questions.